So this is the long promised talk. I've, people have asked me this numerous times over the last few years. You know, what was it, Doug, that led you to leave fundamentalist Christianity? So I'm going to talk about that finally. I've brought in my Bible that I was using at the time I left Christianity. This is the New American Standard Version, uh, which was designed to be a very uh, accurate translation, but not nearly as <coughs> poetic as the King James Version that most of you have heard. It also has extra wide margins of work <coughs> on each side so you can take notes. This was designed to be a note-taking Bible. And I brought that along because that was uh, instrumental in my departure from fundamentalist Christianity. I do want to emphasize a couple things before we get going today. First of all, this is not... I don't want this Sunday to be a beat up the Bible or beat up Christianity Sunday. Um, I know a lot of people have come out of fundamentalist backgrounds, and there's always this uh, venting process that you go through. I went through it, many of you have gone through it, some of you may not have gone through it yet and desperately want to, to just tell everyone else how frustrating and maddening it was for you in, in your particular voyage, your journey. And I get that. Uh, but I also understand that there are people on the other side of the aisle who still find the Bible to be extremely important and meaningful if they, even if they don't hold to a fundamentalist understanding of the Bible. So it's always a tricky path for me as a minister to walk that fine line back and forth. I end up stepping on people's toes at some point or another. It just happens. This is my story today of how I got to where I am, how I got to here, to be standing at this pulpit, in fact. And it's not meant to insult or antagonize anybody, but it is the truth in my life. The second thing I want to talk about is this notion of scripture, that you have literature that is ordained by God or inspired by God or the goddess or the gods or, or something supernatural. <coughs> Personally, I think all these scriptures that we have were written by people. They're not written by God or supernatural beings, and you may disagree with me on that. I find that scriptures can be extremely valuable, but it's also very important to understand they were written by people. And you give kudos to the people who put down words they thought might inspire others. <clears throat> and if you hold the Bible in that light, that's one thing. If you hold the Bible, on the other hand, as directly inspired and inerrant, that means without error, that it was given through the direction of God. Not that God literally brought a hand down and wrote it, but that God did essentially dictate it through the minds of the people who wrote it, then that's another thing, because now you have something that is supposed to be completely accurate both historically and theologically. The understanding of God, the understanding of what comes in the future, what has happened in the past, all these things are meant to be taken as literally as possible. And when you do that, a lot of damage can be done. And so, there are different types of Christianity. The type I was in was fundamentalist Christianity. What does that mean? First of all, the term fundamentalist was not meant to be derogatory or meant to impugn insult to those who held it. When I was a Christian, I was proud to be a fundamentalist Christian. That wasn't a term of insult. It was a term of, this is where I stand. This is what I believe. So what is a fundamentalist Christian? Uh, the term was popularized, first of all, back in 1920, so we're closing in on the 100-year anniversary. It was designed, or I should say it was created, by a Baptist editor, Curtis Lee Laws, and he was trying to designate Christians who were ready to do battle royale for the fundamentals, the fundamentals of the faith. And what are these fundamentals of the faith? And by the way, I held to all of these, absolutely, for many years. First of all, the inerrancy of the Bible. It had no error. It was from God. It was not written just by people. It was written by people under the influence of the Holy Spirit. Secondly, 
If you are a fundamentalist, you believe in the literal nature of the biblical accounts. They're not metaphors. They are history. These things really happened. Noah's Ark really happened. All the conquests of Israel by the Israelites are history and really happened. The exodus out of Egypt really happened. The miracles of Jesus really happened. The creation account in Genesis is how we got here. You believe in the virgin birth of Christ. Jesus was born of Mary, who had, was a virgin, and that pregnancy was created by God. This is the only instance of this. It's unique, and it shows Christ's divinity, because you also believe in the deity of Christ, that he was indeed part of the Trinity. You believe in the bodily resurrection of Jesus, as well as his, as his return in the future. You believe that Christ died on the cross as a substitution for your sacrifice, which is what you should have to do is pay in your blood for your sins. He was a substitutionary sacrifice. He atoned for your sins. He paid for your sins. That's why he died. He didn't die because he was a revolutionary. He didn't die because he stood up to the Roman government. He died because God demanded a sacrifice. <clears throat> and finally, you believe in a literal heaven and hell. That those who die in a state of grace, who have believed on the Lord Jesus Christ and are saved, will go on to eternal uh, paradise, and those who don't, to eternal torment. It's not a metaphor. It's literal. You will be tortured for all eternity. These are the things I believe. These were the things that were taught in my church. I went to independent Bible churches for the most part. Similar to Baptists, but not part of a denomination, and these churches believe these things. And I cannot emphasize enough, as I go through this discussion today, every time I say fundamentalist, it's not an insult. It is a category. It is a clarification of the beliefs of a subsection of Christianity. Uh, I gave a sermon similar to this once in seminary, and someone was just outraged that I would use the term fundamentalist. How can you insult people? And I said I wasn't insulting them. And I made that clear in the sermon. But to some people, especially because we have fundamentalist terrorists today, um, the term now has no other meaning than just people who are horrible and stupid and murderous. Not what I mean when I say fundamentalist. I was one. And they're very nice people. They don't want to kill you. They don't want to torture you. They don't want to do horrible things. They believe in the fundamentals of the Bible. Uh, when I was a teenager, I was terrified of dying and going to hell. And I didn't know what to do. And I was ultimately thrilled to find some people who had the answer. I desperately wanted the answer. And here were people who had the answer. Faith Bible Church in Reston, Virginia. Uh, that's where I was saved, that's where I was baptized, that's where I adopted the view that the Bible could be trusted. It was God's Word, and all I had to do was study it. And it was a great church. I loved that church. <clears throat> Wonderful people. They weren't the sort that yelled and screamed in the pulpit. In fact, I never went to a church like that. If someone was yelling and screaming, that just meant to me they didn't really know what they were talking about. And the churches I went to would go through the Bible verse by verse and teach it and took it very seriously. When you went to a church that I went to, everyone brought their <coughs> Bible with them. They weren't in the pews to be pulled out to look at a little reading. Everyone had a Bible, and they had markings in their Bible, and they were highlighting and writing and underlining. Uh, the Bible was the textbook for a successful and happy life as well as your salvation. And the single most important factor in being a fundamentalist Christian is this notion that you have God's Word. This pillar is a, the one upon which everything else is built. If this Bible is not God's Word, then you just pick and choose. And so you either have it or you don't. It was an all-or-nothing proposition in my mind. All those other things I listed the requirements to be a fundamentalist Christian, they all hinged on the fact that the Bible said so. It didn't hinge on God revealing something to you directly. It's based on what the Bible says. 
And once you reject that notion, then you just, like in a buffet line, buffet Jesus, I like to call it. <laughs> you pick the words of Jesus you like, those are the nice ones. You ignore the words of Jesus you don't like, like I will come back, I will judge you, I will divide the wheat from the chaff, and the chaff will go into everlasting torment. But we don't like that Jesus. No. So he didn't say that. Jesus said the nice stuff, but not the bad stuff. In my church, Jesus said it all. And you took every word very seriously. It wasn't buffet Jesus. It was all or nothing Jesus. <clears throat> so, obviously, I believe the Bible was the inerrant, flawless, perfect word of God. But the problem was, as I studied the Bible... <clears throat> And I studied it a lot. I've read the entire Bible through twice. I've read portions as many as ten times. And I was starting on my third time through from beginning to end. And this journey began in Dayton, Ohio, around 1995. I was going to the Air Force Institute of Technology at the time, through the Air Force, getting a master's degree in management or logistics management, which is heavy in statistics. And you have to understand... I went to a Bible college and majored in English education. So my brain was being melted down on a daily basis. Statistics courses that would just make you cry, where the formulas were mostly Greek symbols. They just stopped using numbers. It was just one Greek symbol after another. And I spent about a year and a half wondering how I'm going to be the first person to fail this program, because this is just blowing my mind. And you can ask Jancy. It's the only time in our marriage she thought I'd walk out the door and never come back, because the stress was off the charts. I never thought about walking out and not coming back, by the way. But she could tell I was under huge stress. We were going to a super conservative church, an Orthodox Presbyterian church at the time. If you're not familiar with them, they make the uh, <clears throat> local Presbyterian churches look like a bunch of pagans because <laughs> these people were so serious about their Christianity that if you, if you did anything wrong, they would excommunicate you. So we never joined, so they couldn't excommunicate us, but super, super conservative probably the most conservative Presbyterian denomination in the U.S. And as I was doing my daily Bible study, squeezing that in along with all my homework from AFIT, I got fed up with some passages that stopped making sense to me. And I started writing them down. And here's my sheet of paper. It's all crumpled up, too. I swear I must have crumpled this up to throw it away at some point and then pulled it back out and said, no, I'm sticking with this. And I wrote down notes. And this is, this is it. This is the sheet right here, the straw that broke the camel's back. My final notes from the Bible, and those are what I'm going to be sharing with you today. The reasons I concluded that the Bible wasn't from God. It was written by people. It was written by men. And as you're going to see, it's written by men who didn't like women very much, too. Yeah, yeah. So here we go. And by the way, in the future, when people ask me, Doug, what made you leave fundamentalism? I can now say, go to our website, check out the sermon on January 21st, 2018, because I'm going to lay it all out right now. I even have the little tabs marked in the Bible. I was starting at the beginning, going through, so the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, I can still do that. I can do most of the books of the Bible from memory. Uh, it was ingrained. Genesis, I got through Genesis without taking notes, uh, but when I hit Exodus, it started to fall apart. The wheels came off. In Exodus chapter 20, you have the Ten Commandments. God gives the Ten Commandments, the famous Ten Commandments, the Cecil B. DeMille Ten Commandments with Moses on the mountain. <laughs> what do you think the very next thing in chapter 21 is that God lays the laws out? Because now we're getting a bunch of laws from God. If you are a fundamentalist, these are God's words. What was the... What, just take a wild guess. What's the next most important thing after the Ten Commandments that God felt was important to lay out and codify the laws for. Slavery. Absolutely. Chapter 21 is all about slavery. And if you ever wonder why during the Civil War the South could cite the Bible as a defense for slavery, it's because the Bible 
ordains slavery. And to ignore that fact is to ignore reality. Here we go. If you, a Hebrew slave, I'm sorry, if you buy a Hebrew slave, so you could buy slaves from within the Hebrew people, it's not outsiders. He shall serve for six years, but on the seventh he shall go out as a free man without payment. Every seven years the slaves are supposed to be released. <coughs> If he comes alone, he shall go out alone. If he's the husband of a wife, his wife shall go out with him. So if he's married to a woman, when he becomes a slave, she gets to go with him when he leaves. However, if the master gives him a wife, and she bears him sons or daughters, the wife and her children shall belong to the master, and he shall go out alone. Now, if you're a slave, you got married after you became a slave, you love your wife and kids and don't want to leave them, you do have an option. If the slave plainly says, I love my master, my wife and my children, I shall not go out as a free man, then his master shall bring him to God, he shall bring him to the door or the doorpost, and the master shall pierce his ear with an awl, and he shall serve him permanently. But that's not the worst part. The next verse is one I wrote down and highlighted and underlined. I still got the yellow highlight in here. Man sells daughter, I write in my margin. If a man sells his daughter as a female slave, she is not to go free as male slaves do. If she is displeasing in the eyes of her master who designated her for himself, we are talking about sexual slavery at this point, by the way. Yeah then he shall let her be redeemed. He does not have authority to sell her to a foreign people because of his unfairness to her. And if he designates her for his son to be his sex toy, he shall deal with her according to the customs of daughters. If he takes himself another woman, he may not reduce her food, her clothing, or her conjugal rights. Just in case you didn't think this was about sex. So, the very first thing God talks about after the Ten Commandments is slavery, including the notion that a man may sell his daughter into slavery, and that the women who are sold into slavery are being sold into sex slavery. And I wrote that down on my little piece of paper, imagine that. And again, I want to stress, this is my journey. What you make of it is your business. And I don't want to spend the second hour beating up the Bible either, please. I'm just telling you why I left fundamentalism. And I'm going to keep emphasizing that. The next thing that struck me as odd was the fact that, you know, every church I went to was staunchly pro-life. Absolutely, 100%, no exception, pro-life. Totally opposed to abortion because the minute the sperm hits the egg, you have a human being. Except, I found out, the Bible doesn't actually teach that. In Exodus 21-22, and I have talked about this before in my abortion sermon, so pardon me for repeating, we have this situation. If, a, if men struggle against each other and strike a woman with child so she has a miscarriage, and there's no further injury, he shall surely be fined, monetary fine, as the woman's husband may demand of him. Not the woman, not the woman who lost the child, the woman's husband. <laughs> and he shall pay as the judges decide. So, if you cause a woman to have a miscarriage, you're not being charged with murder. You are going to pay a fine, depending on what the husband says. But, if there is any further injury, then you shall appoint as a penalty Life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burn for burn, wound for wound, bruise for bruise. Any other injury shall be repaid in kind. Life for life. But causing a merit miscarriage is not life for life. The man is not put to death who caused the miscarriage. There is no equality between a living man and an unborn child. That blew my mind. The Bible's crystal clear on this point. They're not the same thing. And of course, I had been taught they were the same thing for years. 
So that was note number two on my wrinkled piece of paper. Number three, <clears throat> this is about interest. You may, have, you may know from history that the Jewish people were often hated because they would be money lenders. And they're allowed to be money lenders in the Bible, but they can't be money lenders to each other. And so we have Exodus 22, 25. If you lend money to my people, to the poor among you, you are not to act as a creditor to him. You shall not charge him interest. Now this one struck me as odd because why would the creator of the universe, the creator of infinite number of worlds and galaxies and living beings we can't even imagine, why would that God decide it was important to tell the Jews that they couldn't charge interest to each other. And, and I realize that may not sound profound, but it struck me as just really odd that that would be a divine command. <laughs> that it's okay, because it, now it's separating people, you know. You can charge interest to everyone else, just not the Jewish people. Number four. And this is uh, Exodus 34, 7. He will by no means leave the guilty unpunished. This is God. He will by no means leave the guilty unpunished, visiting the iniquity of fathers on the children and on the grandchildren to the third and fourth generations. If there is iniquity in someone's life, the punishment will go on for three or four generations. There is no justice in this notion. It's certainly not how our justice system welcomes. Imagine if a man commits murder and his grandchildren are punished for it. Uh, again, that, that one doesn't need much more commentary. Uh, the innocent are being punished when they didn't do anything, when their father or grandfather did something. <coughs> Next one, we have Leviticus 18. Leviticus 18 is a list of sexual prohibitions. And after we go through all these family relations you're not supposed to have sex with, and also, by the way, the passage that quite clearly says that men may not have sex with other men or they should be put to death, and any, any, anyone who tries to reinterpret that passage any other way is being dishonest with the passage. I've never understood why... Uh, gay people would still want to hold the Bible in esteem when the Bible says these horrible things about them. I've never understood why women find it important when the Bible says so many horrible things about them. But after we go through all these prohibitions, we have this odd little passage. Because we all know you're only supposed to be married to one woman if you're a man. Except, <laughs> except, and you shall not marry a woman in addition to her sister as a rival while she is alive to uncover her nakedness. Um, why would there be a passage that says you can't take another wife unless you're allowed to take another wife? You just can't take your wife's sister as the other wife. So polygamy is still okay in Leviticus. It's not just a Genesis thing. It's in the Mosaic Law. And then the next passage was about priests, because we talked about slavery a little while ago. And we see in chapter 22 of Leviticus that priests, those who speak for God, those who are the most holy, who enter into the Holy of Holies in the temple, buy slaves. <clears throat> but if a priest buys a slave as his property with his money, uh, and then he's talking about the food that's been sacrificed. Uh, that one may eat of it, and those who are born in his house may eat of the food. So a priest slave is allowed to eat the food that's sacrificed, because the priest could eat a portion of the sacrifices that were made in the temple, and animals were killed and burned, and then the priest could eat part of it. Priests could buy slaves. Just in case anyone's saying slavery isn't okay, not only is it okay, it's okay for the priests to do. And finally, and this one seems to be the backbreaker, because this is where my notes stopped. I stopped writing things down. This is about a man who's jealous of his wife and thinks she's been unfaithful. 
And it says, If a spirit of jealousy comes over him, and he is jealous of his wife when she has defiled herself, or if a spirit of jealousy comes over him, and he is jealous of his wife, and she has not defiled herself. So it doesn't matter whether she's guilty or not. If the man is jealous, then the man shall bring his wife to the priest, and shall bring as an offering of her one-tenth of an ephah of barley meal. He shall not pour oil on it. He shall not put frankincense on it. It is a grain offering of jealousy, a grain offering of memorial, a reminder of iniquity. Now remember, she may be innocent, but it's a reminder of iniquity. Then the priest shall bring her near and have her stand before the Lord. And the priest shall take holy water in an earthenware vessel, and he shall take some of the dust that is on the floor of the tabernacle and put it in the water. Bowl of water, dust from the floor mixed into the water. The priest shall then have the woman stand before the Lord and let the hair of the woman's head go loose and place the grain offering of memorial in her hands, which is the grain offering of jealousy. In the hand of the priest is to be the water of bitterness that brings a curse. So now we have this bowl of water with dirt mixed into it, and it's the water of bitterness. And the priest shall have her take an oath, and shall say to the woman, If no man has lain with you, and you have not gone astray into uncleanness, being under the authority of your husband, be immune to this water of bitterness that brings a curse. If you, however, have gone astray, being under the authority of your husband, and you have defiled yourself, and a man other than your husband has had intercourse with you, then the priest shall have the woman swear with the oath of the curse, and the priest shall say to the woman, The Lord make you a curse and an oath among your people by the Lord's making your thigh waste away and your abdomen swell. And this water which brings a curse shall go into your stomach and make your abdomen swell and your thigh waste away, and the woman shall say, Amen, Amen. Then the priest shall write these curses on a scroll, and he shall... Wash them off in the waters of bitterness. Then he shall make the woman drink the water of bitterness that brings a curse, so that the water which brings a curse will go into her and cause bitterness. And the priest shall take the grain offering of jealousy from the woman's hand, and he shall wave the grain offering before the Lord and bring it to the altar. And it goes on and on. I will add, by the way, that there is no way for a woman to, taste, to test a man's Faithfulness. Exactly. At that point, as I said, I stopped writing stuff down on my piece of paper. At that point, I may have crumpled it up and said, that's enough. I know what I need to know. I don't remember. I really don't remember. I found this in my Bible a few months ago and said, okay, now I remember what I was going through at the time and I can share that. So now came the hard part. I had to decide to make a big change in my life. We're undergoing incredible stress as it is, and then I have to tell Jancy, oh, by the way, I'm not a believer anymore. At least I don't think I'm a believer anymore. And, and what's she going to do when I tell her this? Fortunately, uh, she said, well, let's go through this journey together. Let's start asking questions. Let's try some other churches. And so we did. We went to churches that were a little less strict than the Orthodox Presbyterian Church. I did speak to that minister once. He just got furious at me. <laughs> and that's fine. You can't excommunicate me because I wasn't ever a member. <laughs> can't make me drink the waters of bitterness. <laughs> so we went to a Bible church similar to the ones I had been in before. One Sunday, my kids come out and said, Dad! They tore up a Book of Mormon in Sunday school. And I went and talked to the teacher and said, what's going on? He goes, I was demonstrating that this, bi this Book of Mormon's worthless, that it's just a tool of Satan, and he ripped it up in front of him. So I went and reported him to the director of ch children's education or Sunday school or whatever the term was, and I said, you know, I don't like the Book of Mormon either, but you really shouldn't have your teachers ripping it up in front of the children. And I think that's inappropriate, and they agreed. So we didn't stay at that church very long. Went later to a church with a female minister, and I asked her, what did she do with all these Bible verses that were against women? You know, the, Paul says that if a, first of all, a woman should 
remain silent in church. And secondly, if she has any questions, she should wait till she gets home and ask her husband. <laughs> Women shall not have authority over men. Women shall be keepers at home. Unquote. These are all from the New Testament. And I said, what do you do with all this? You're a Christian minister. Why do you... Why? No good answer. And finally, we just stopped going to church. Enjoyed our Sunday mornings, went to the bagel shop, read the newspaper, had coffee, whatever. It's like, wow, Sunday mornings are nice. <laughs> yeah, I shouldn't say that. <laughs> and I never set foot in a church again, and I swore I never would. And that was well over 11 years of not going to church. Um, but here, at this church... I decided to break that vow. And <laughs> Jim Accord, right there in the back, was the speaker. And I'm glad he's here. And Bill Davis, I tell this story a couple of times you know, every other year or so. Bill Davis put the things in the newspaper, the little announcements. And the announcement said, Jim Accord is going to speak on a book called God is Not Great. Christopher Hitchens. <laughs> and me, the avowed angry atheist who will never set foot in church again, said, you know, I know these Unitarian Universalists are pretty liberal, so I bet he's actually going to be speaking favorably about this book, not unfavorably. <laughs> and I called up the president at the time, Van, and I asked a few questions, and uh, I said, okay, maybe I'll risk this crazy church. Uh, <laughs> doesn't sound too scary and you know I had just come back from a year deployment in Afghanistan I was having a terrible time readjusting to life here again uh, a lot of stress there and Chancy and I had missed the fellowship of a church even if we didn't agree with the doctrines and I said mm -hmm. how would you like to go try this and she said sure <laughs> and the rest is history I won't retell all that story loved it and here I am that's the story once the notion of the Bible being the inerrant word of God was rejected by me, it, the rest of it collapsed. Christianity was dead to me. Um, because I had been taught so many times that once you reject the Bible as the complete and total and completely accurate and reliable word of God, and you start just cherry-picking the verses you like, it's meaningless. And so I bought into that. It's meaningless. It's not scripture. It's just the writings of people. So you can't, can't know the mind of God from this. And liberal Christianity, in all fairness, is less consistent than fundamentalist Christianity. Because liberal Christians do pick the portions they like and reject them. Oh, there's no hell. God wouldn't do that. Except the Bible talks about it. Well, those parts aren't divinely inspired. These parts are. Then it's just a matter of opinion. And that's not to say it's bad. It's not to say, I mean, I did my internship at a liberal Christian church. Great people. But for me, no resonance. And that's the, that's the bottom line of this sermon. I'm telling you my story. I'm not saying you have to think anything at all like I think. You don't have to come to the same conclusions I come to. But this is what caused me to leave the fundamentalist fold of Christianity, and indeed all forms of Christianity. Um, I, I, because of what I've been through, I'm never going to be able to look at the Bible and go, what a beautiful collection of literature. <laughs> what inspiring passages. And there are inspiring passages, and there are great things in the Bible, but I carry around too much memories of the harm it has also caused. So if you expect me to think that way, you will be disappointed. But you can. Your life is different. Your background is different. You may not have the scars I have. And I would never look at someone who held the Bible in hell esteem in high esteem and say, well, you're stupid. Here, let me tell you why you shouldn't do that. That's not my business. It's not my interest. I don't care to do that. What does bug me is when people use it to attack other people, which is happening all the time. And so at times it's maddening for me to walk this balance 
in a group of people who have so many different views, who many of you hold the Bible in high regard, even if you don't hold it to be the inerrant word of God. And you're probably disappointed in me at times, because I don't. And sometimes I come across as very dismissive. I know that. And uh, hopefully you can cut me a little slack too, now that you know my background. Uh, and I will try to be uh, careful in how I approach things. I do think it's very important that we understand why the Bible is not the inerrant word of God. Why it is written by people. And move on from there. <coughs> so, what I want to do in the second hour, I, you know, I don't want this to devolve into let's bash the Bible, let's bash fundamentalists. Fundamentalist Christians are super nice people, good people. I have nothing but mostly fond memories of the people, and they do good things, but they also you know, shut their minds off to certain truths, deliberately taking a path of faith instead of a path of reason. And these wonderful, nice people do think that God is going to torture people for all eternity. And all their relationships are colored by this notion that somehow I have to slip the gospel in. And, and I have to get all these people saved. That my purpose on earth is not to enjoy this life, but to get through it, saving as many people as I can, sharing the gospel when I can, and saving others. And your life becomes a hell on earth. You can't have a genuine, warm, caring relationship with someone else without constantly wanting to look for that time to slip the gospel in. Mm -hmm. And the friendships become tools mm -hmm. to lead people to Christ. And it's, it's not a mean or deceptive thing. You literally believe these people are going to hell and you have to save them in any way you can. And how seriously screwed up is that? <laughs> I do not have to... Amen, brother. <laughs> I, do not, I, do not need, I do not feel compelled for one second to tell any of you how to believe about anything. I do not feel compelled to share the things that are meaningful to me with you in the course of a conversation. You know, some of you know I practice Zen Buddhism. I don't go around trying to convert people to Zen Buddhism. I really don't. I don't even bring it up. If you want to come here on Wednesday night at 6, fine. <laughs> Sit and stare at a wall with us for 25 minutes. <laughs> I can assure you it'll knock your socks off. <laughs> but I don't feel that compulsion. I don't. You get to be who you are. I get to be who I am. And that's the joy of being in this congregation. Um, so I hope you will allow me to be who I am, sometimes that old curmudgeon, the guy who just doesn't get excited about the Bible, because I'm just not going to get excited about the Bible. Um, it's a collection of works by people who are trying to grasp cosmic realities. And sometimes they inserted into this horrible, oppressive laws, because that was the nature of the time. And then somebody decided, we're going to say this came from God. And that's where it all went nuts. Yeah. No, the creator of the cosmos, billions upon billions, trillions, unnumbered stars, galaxies, and who knows how many other life forms out there, did not come to Earth and say, you know, when you decide you want to sell your daughter into slavery, here's how you do it. <laughs> I'm not buying it. And I'm not buying it with 100% certainty. I just don't think that happened. I could be wrong, but I'm going with, no, that one wasn't from God. That one came from people. <laughs> so in the second hour, what I would encourage is that if you have questions about my journey or want to talk about your journey, if you have Bible questions, feel free to ask. But let's, let's try, because I know this can be construed as a bit of a downer talk. Let's try to be uplifting in the second hour and focus on, you know, if you want to learn something about the Bible, ask me. If you want to share positive things, like how positive, I will say, this congregation has been in my life, how it helped me to get over adjustment after being at war, how it gave me purpose and meaning for going into 10 years almost here as your minister. Those are the good and uplifting stories. People wanted to know how I got here. 
Now you know how I got here. And by the way, thanks for coming and attending my very last sermon of my ninth year of ministry. And join me on February 4th for the first sermon of my 10th year. Thanks for coming. <laughs>